Hello, welcome back to Marathon Man, where I'm going through Doctor Who from the beginning. You join me as the show meets the Daleks for the very first time. Everyone knows what a Dalek is, what it looks like, and they probably have a lame joke about it not being able to climb stairs. More people could identify a Dalek than they could who played the Fifth Doctor. There's no getting away from them. They're as much part of the show's DNA as the TARDIS and the fact that every few years the Doctor changes appearance. Like the first story can be a little bit disorienting if somebody is used to a more established program. Watching the Daleks with a lot of preconceived ideas of what we now know the Daleks to be can make for an unexpected but rewarding experience. Every time I watch this story, I always try and remove those preconceived ideas from my brain. Years ago, I watched it with a new to old Who viewer who wouldn't shut up about the Dalek only paralysing Ian when we know full well that a Dalek's blast kills. <laughs> Legs! My legs! Your legs are paralysed! Now, I'm of the opinion that this is the first time we ever see a Dalek use its gun. How are we supposed to know how it works? If the last story did a good job of selling Ian and Barbara's unease at being out of their own time, and I happen to think that it did, this story finds them off-world for the first time. And they seem to take it quite well, to be honest. Maybe because they've become accustomed to the TARDIS travelling through time that being on a different planet isn't such a big deal to them. But it kind of should be. Obviously they still want to get home, but they react to being on an alien planet as if the motorway services that they've stopped in hasn't got a Starbucks. No, no. Pumpkin Cafe sucks. You go for your dump and I'll meet you in WH Smith's. So, they're not being keen to stay here means the Doctor has to come up with some conniving mischief in order to get his own way and explore the city like he wants to. Which is a really satisfying story beat and character point all in one. It's not overly vindictive, it's definitely petulant and certainly irresponsible. It's the actions of a traveller who's used to getting his own way and not having a collective to answer to. So, as we start piecing the character of the Doctor together, he still isn't the archetypal good guy yet, but he is fascinating to spend time with. It brings out his love of exploration and his enthusiasm for the unknown, some of the more famous Doctor character traits, while still leaving lots to find out about him. It's also worth remembering that he has spent a good deal of time on 20th century Earth, not a time that he seemed to have a lot of love for. So no wonder he's super keen to get out and start exploring an alien planet for the first time in a good while. And these actions, ultimately endangering the people he's brought along with him against their will, serves to remind us that we are still very much in Ian and Barbara's story, and they do remain at the heart of the show throughout the Daleks. The Daleks themselves, Scaro, the city, they're all well realised. Even though it's nearly 60 years old, there's nothing really here for a modern eye to sneer at, and I mean the design of the Daleks has quite clearly lasted for more than half a century. And I really like the Daleks in their first showing here, not to the extent that I'm rooting for them obviously, but it's easy to see why they've endured on the basis of this story. They look, sound and move like nothing else, and because the travellers actually spend a fair amount of time at their mercy in a very weakened state, they actually feel really formidable as foes. Um, the voice actors uh, are able to craft quite interesting performances without having to follow what's come before. We all know what Daleks sound like, and even though subsequent voice artists, Nicholas Briggs especially, have found different ways to inject nuance into Dalek speech, here they're not burdened by any precedent. For example, Daleks in distress will come to be as monotone as everything else they say, with lots of visions being impaired, etc. But here in this story, when they take the radiation drugs, actual discombobulation, even fear, can be detected in their voices. It could be embarrassingly funny, and it probably is to some ears, especially ears that have been raised on like later iterations of Daleks, but here I think it's really effective. It sounds like a Daleks trodden on a plug and I really like it. The Thals are less interesting for obvious reasons, but it is nice that Barbara has a hint of a romance, even though it should very obviously be with Ian. She also deserves better in my opinion, the Thals don't really register as like meaty characters at all. They're sympathetic, but with their backstory and their noble temperament, so it is a shame to some extent when they start dying on their way to and upon arriving at the city. But they're very much this story's sacrificial meat. They're 
they're expendathals. <laughs> now, while I'm waxing lyrical, you might be forgiven for thinking that I'm a Blinkered fan who thinks that Doctor Who can do no wrong, so it would be remiss of me to not point out that I happen to think that at the point where they have to traipse back to the city for the fluid link and rope the Thals into helping them after convincing them of the danger of the Daleks, the story does sag a bit. A, a bit. Seven episodes is one, maybe two, episodes too long. And the long journey that they undertake can be a little testing on the patients, despite valiant efforts from Terry Nation to pepper it with enough exciting incident. Antidus is chicken out. Ant Antidus. Antidus is chickening out. Antidus is chickening out, but being forced to continue is fairly engaging, even though when he sacrifices himself and lets himself fall to save Ian, it isn't all that impactful. Is it meant to be a redemption? If so, what for? Being being a bit scared? I mean, like it feels okay to be scared. He's actually still going through with everything. And speaking of scared, allow me again to stick up a bit for Susan. Her reputation would have you believe that she just screams and screams and screams and is a damsel in distress. Now, there are moments in the show where that is hard to argue with, but here at this moment, I still don't think she's degenerated into that yet. The responsibility of going back to the TARDIS by her, that's squarely on her shoulders. She has to do it alone because the others are too sick. Incidentally, quite a nice bit of jeopardy that they would slowly succumb to radiation poisoning, which would have surely played on very real fears that people would have had at the time because of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And so while she is most definitely scared, she makes the trip, she does it, she saves her friends, she puts herself through it, she is brave. What is it that the third doctor said? Courage isn't just a matter of not being frightened, you know. What is it then? It's being afraid and doing what you have to do anyway. It's also worth remembering that Susan is presented as a child, and even though she was in her early 20s at the time, Caroline Ford is very good at reminding us of that. When she's spoken to by a Dalek, she giggles. What is the last word here? The last word? So, sad. <laughs> stop that noise. It's a really good, relatable moment. And it's also kind of nice that if anybody uses the Daleks to take the piss out of Doctor Who, Doctor Who will have almost certainly beaten them to it. 11 episodes in and I am still firmly on board with the travels of the crew. A big thing was made about the lack of cliffhangers when Doctor Who came back in 2005 and I have to admit I missed them as well. They felt like such a big part of the show. So finishing one story but then having a cliffhanger for the next one is a really good incentive to keep watching. Especially as we've only just been introduced to these characters and we care about them, we want to know what happens to them. Uh, a big part of that is the, uh, uh, their, their chemistry. That's the reason that we love this team so much. When the Doctor's lie backfires, Ian just doesn't go in for petty recriminations. And that would be so easy to do on account of having been placed directly in harm's way. The fact that he doesn't tells us, and crucially the Doctor, like so much about Ian. If it weren't for him and Barbara, Susan and the Doctor would meet their end in this story. And vice versa, they complement each other perfectly. There is a lot to be said for serialised storytelling, and it does continue to this day. In other programmes, not so much in this one anymore, um, although it, it did make a welcome return in Flux. But when Flux came along, that was a different approach to Doctor Who, and I think that's why I responded to it, and it kind of goes to show that it's now no longer really the norm in Doctor Who, and that's okay. But it is interesting and rewarding to revisit a time in the show where it was the norm. Yeah, I have seen every episode of Doctor Who several times before, but I always feel compelled to keep watching on marathons because of the lure of the next episode. The lead character's predicament is so unique and compelling that I feel invested every single time. And it's why I always kick off a Doctor Who marathon at like a rollicking pace, because of the dovetail from story to story. And because the journey never lets up for these characters, although I will admit I only half-heartedly follow them into the caves in Scarrow, I'm along for the ride as well. I'm enjoying the whirlwind too much to slow down now, basically. No question. The cliffhanger to that first episode, The Dead Planet, is famous for a reason. <coughs> it's that lengthy detour in the caves. I just find it sags a little bit, brings the story down. So out of five... It's another four, slightly behind uh, uh, an unearthly child, but still a solid effort. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, you know how YouTube works, please hit that like button. It really, really helps the channel. And what did you think of this story? 
Do the Daleks make an immediate impact on you, or are they not quite the Daleks that you know and love yet? Do you find the episode the ordeal and ordeal as well, or do you enjoy the pace of storytelling at work here? Let me know in the comments below, and I'll see you back here for the final two episodes of the original 13 episode order for Doctor Who, where something strange is happening in the TARDIS. So if you don't want to miss that, make sure you hit the subscribe button, clang the cloister bell, and I'll meet you at the edge of destruction. See you soon.